Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Conversations with Coaches podcast. I'm your host, Kevin, and today I have the pleasure of meeting and immediately sharing with you Michael Coast. Michael is a former professional windsurfer and CEO of a listed Fortune 500 subsidiary. Michael has always been a passionate listener, supporting people in motivational change, performance, and leadership aspects. Having consistently delivered outstanding results in both worlds, he decided to support leaders in shaping their business and personal growth journeys. Michael, I like I like that approach because I feel like we separate those at our peril. And so I'm excited to talk to you about like how you how you how you coach that, how you how you live that as well. So it's great to meet you and I'm glad to have you on the pod today. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Yeah, let's let's start not at the beginning beginning, but let's start at like your beginnings as as the coach you've decided to be today. Um how did you realize that you really wanted to take this approach, this sort of personal and professional hybrid because a lot of times a lot of coaches will really focus in and hone in on one or two specific elements of someone's personal or professional development how do you how did you find yourself being called to try to be the coach that works with both sides merges them together how did how did you find yourself in that position yeah where where it all started was in my job basically i've been coaching people internally for for many years and quite successfully too you see these people getting promoted and everything and, and obviously that's very exciting and very rewarding too because you like to think that you made a small contribution but what what i also realized is that you know personal growth comes hand in hand with what an organization is doing and how they're shaping their own future so for me it's always been a, a matter of combining um, the personal and the business growth through shifting perspectives. And what I mean by shifting perspectives is simply uh, going from looking backward to looking forward. Sounds mm. really, really simple. But <laughs> a lot of companies, if you think about it, keep looking backward. We've had an excellent year, great, you know, great bonus and this and the other. Um, the following year, everything goes bad and employees are getting laid off and this and that. That's just because they were hit by something they didn't see coming. So by looking backward, your chances of succeeding and, and sustainably being su successful in, in your field of business is fairly limited. So you've got to look forward, see what's coming. And I'm a big advocate of creating basically a, a call it the, the disruption department, not mm -hmm. someone who works alongside the top team or whatever, doing a bit of thinking. No, someone who deliberately tries to um, kill their own business, mm. not in the intent to kill it, but to determine what comes for a more successful and sustainable future. Now, mm. along with this, obviously, the people are, are, are a key component. And when your business strategy moves from A to B, which it has to, um, research shows uh, most businesses reinvent or evolve their strategy every two and a half years. That's mm. that's crazy. In the past, it used to be like every 10 years or whatever, but now it's every two and a half years. And if you don't, well, guess what? The likelihood is um, you, you might be less successful in, in the future. So from a personal perspective, it's the same thing. I'm in a job today and I look backward. Yeah, I've done this and I've been very successful. I've done that. I've been very successful. The problem is as a manager or as a, as a leader in my organization, my leadership brand, the thing that I see myself in or how I am, is rarely coinciding with what the company sees. Mm. Um, so what, what, what happens is I'm the manager and I'm doing a great job. Now, this other guy is getting promoted and there's a vacancy coming up. And I think I'm super good in what I'm doing. Therefore, I qualify for, the, for this job uh, to take over. But, you know, the company selects somebody else. And I go, Why? I've done this in the past, I've been successful doing this, and I'm good at that, and so on and so forth. No, 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 mm. because the new job has new requirements, right? So if you're a team member, let's say, who does the day-to-day -day and so on, and you get promoted to the manager of that team, you can no longer act the way you did. You have to learn new skills. You have to learn delegation, also hard conversations when the performance is not there. You have to learn new things. So you're Past success is no guarantee for future success. And this is where I love to work with organizations in terms of um, redefining their, their strategy for the year to come, as well as uh, working with their leaders, creating, call it a joint purpose, like a strategic leadership agenda for the company, which basically is like in sports, you know, you 
you design a new jersey, a uh, new color, new flag, new outlook, uh, uh, ambitions, and so on and so forth, and the path to get to um, that that future ambition. Hmm. I man, I really, really, really like that. This is something that's a, a couple of subjects you touched on come up repeatedly on, in conversations on this podcast and off this podcast with with coaches and leaders and whatnot. And I, that that transition from as you're as you're successful moving through your career, that transition from doing whatever the job was, whatever the role was you began in. And as you as you grow and develop, as you move through the company or move through your career, there's that transition moment where the skills required to continue begin to change. And like you said, there's just, there is, I still, even though we talk about it a lot, I still find that there's not enough attention on how many really promising potential leaders get lost without the guidance they need to make that transition. They get They get stuck looking backwards and wondering why what they did before won't get them where they want to go. And that's why I, I always find myself gravitating back towards that phrase, what got you here won't necessarily get you there. Yes. I find that it's a really good shorthand to kind of like open up that conversation because that's once you accept that, then you can begin to not just cling to past accomplishments or skills that you're very comfortable with and still good at, but look forward and with some guidance by a coach like yourself, really try to select and look for and embrace the acquisition of those new skills that will then demonstrate to the people who would be in charge of promoting you up and promoting you along. It's like, ah, I see this person's looking forward. They're starting to pick up the skills they need to actually lead as opposed to just follow. Let's talk about that. <laughs> yes, uh, very, very true, everything you say. And I think uh, Marshall Goldsmith uh, expressed it uh, very nicely. Um, mm -hmm. And and it, it's correct. I mean, when you're good in your job, it's awesome. But being too good in your job also doesn't make you promotable because who's going to do your job, right? <laughs> so you got to be really, really careful between being good, but also displaying some behaviors that will uh, make it possible for you to succeed in, in the next role. And, and you see a lot of companies as well promoting people who miserably fail after their promotion, which is a shame, yeah. probably because there's a lack of guidance in terms of um you know just sharing with those people what this new role entails and what you like doing and what you're good at is actually no longer part of this role instead you'll have to do this and this and this are you comfortable taking up this challenge so all of these things uh, need to happen and, and they're good conversations uh, to have in an organization be it internal or with the help of an external coach yeah, there's it's it's one of the worst feelings in the world is promoting someone who you genuinely like and admire and respect and you yes. move them into a role that they're that they that they're no longer good in, they're no longer suited for. And you basically you, you, it, you it's two losses because you lose the leader that could have been and you lose the high performer that was. And that's just that's it's the kind of waste that's just like every, it's 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 the lose lose situation across the board and I just I love the the I love the attention being paid to that transition because I mean start with simple questions like really identify whether or not someone's genuinely interested in that promotion and what it entails maybe when you actually really ask them those questions they find that within themselves like you know I don't know if I'm ready or I don't know if I want to develop in that way I really like what I do maybe they are truly content where they are but they need to be asked that question by someone who's willing to listen to their answers and discover that answer together. And that's, I, again, I know I'm kind of sort of sideways complimenting you, but I just, I really, really respect and admire and I'm grateful for coaches like you being focused on that transition because there's such, there's such potential for loss there and there's such potential for gain, both personally and professionally. Yes, that's true. Yeah. And I also, I wanted to, there's something I wanted to go back to because you mentioned um, you didn't quite say it this way, but you were speaking to almost a sort of disruption department where it was yeah. sort of your job to sort of, and I, I, I really liked like the department of disruption got stuck into my head as a phrase because I was, I really, well, I appreciate the, 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 ling the, the linguism on that, but also I really like that concept because there's something, there's something about intentionally testing the resilience of your organization, not just having things happen and then seeing how you respond, but really having people who's primary or a significant part of their job is let's see if we can break this. <laughs> it's very, very yes. common in like development and coding, et cetera, where it's like testing is all about, let's see if we can break this. Let's see where it breaks when we apply pressure. And that will give us maybe some clues as to where we need to put our attention, how we need to build that resilience and that agility that we're going to need 
if we're going to navigate a world in which we have to reinvent ourselves every two to three years, which you say it out loud like that, it's terrifying to think about. <laughs> it is. And um, well, the, the main issue is the most of the companies I'm familiar with. And if I look at the so-called, um, you know, stress test that you run internally and, and how to check whether you can actually break things or, or whatever it might be. Um, what one, one fundamental issue remains with those departments, um, which is they tend to act inside a bubble, right? So say mm. you're whatever in, in the sports goods industry, uh, for argument's sake, and, um, you know, uh, maybe Nike, Puma, Adidas, and and uh, Under Armour, and 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 what have you, will look at oh, how can we do better shoes, better than Nike, better than whatever, and they'll use some new material, and they'll do uh, a lot of marketing on it, and they'll price it up because it has a benefit. Obviously, the Gillette one, two, three, four blades. Every time it gets more expensive, <laughs> but at the end of the day, all it does it shaves, right? So anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that's what's happening a lot. So people look inside the bubble. But now, what if uh, Mr. XYZ uh, comes from uh, Timbuktu and he he enters um, a, a market with it's an unknown competitor, right? So, hmm. and this is where a lot of companies actually can go wrong. And this is where a lot of the internal stress testers are probably not geared uh, to think outside of the bubble. So. Everything that is done tends to be run within the industry uh, the, the, the company is in, rather than trying to go a little more crazy and, and outward looking. And I mentioned Gillette for a reason, because um, everyone knows the Dollar Shave Club, I imagine. Now, mm -hmm. when Procter bought Gillette, it was a hefty 53 billion price tag. And um, four or five years later, the Dollar Shave Club, the, the guy in, in, in his backyard, so to speak, shipping out razor blades on a subscription model uh, came, which obviously made Proctor sweat quite a bit. Now, no <laughs> one thought about this dude, right? Everyone thought about the traditional razor blade manufacturers and, and what have you. Um, and no one thought about this one. So it happens and it happens um, at a higher frequency nowadays than it used to happen in the past. And it has deeper consequences as well on established businesses. So it's crucial to look forward. And when I look, say look forward, I don't mean the year two or three, but it's really where do you want to go as a company in the next 10 years? And you know, you could completely redefine uh, the company as, as it operates currently and, and, um, and envision uh, operating in a, in a completely different field and different industry. And um, there, there are examples of, of such companies too. One thing about success, especially wild long-term success, is that it has a it has a blinding effect. And it, it's a very natural effect as yes. well. It's not something that you need to try to necessarily combat within yourself, but you need to have a strategy for facing that, understanding that as you move forward, your vision will, it'll, just, it'll narrow just by the nature of the size and the scope of the organization you're running, the business you're running, the success you've had for the amount of time you've had it. And someone like a coach, someone who is outside of your bubble, and yet it has intimate and intimate expertise, very precise knowledge of what goes on inside that bubble. And it exists outside of it. Someone who can come in and both know your company and you know, have an inter be have an interaction or relationship with you that is, is is very, very much like I am on your side. I am your ally. I'm your guide. I'm help I'm helping you to, tr to transition or to move through whatever happens to be happening. And yet has that outside perspective and can see. Not like, you know, with the vision of Nostradamus, this is this isn't like this is uncertainty in prediction. And that's why we get lost looking in the past, because we can pretend that we're certain about what we what's always been true and kind of stay away from the uncomfortable what might come around the corner. But that ability to just just forecast and, you know, maybe poke at the bubble and be like, you know, someone might come along. Maybe it's someone in their backyard. Maybe it's someone who's highly capitalized. Maybe it's someone, maybe it's an executive from a rival company who breaks off and starts something new because they see something that might disrupt the industry. Someone like you with that outside perspective, but insider knowledge, insider expertise, there's just really, there's nearly nothing like it. It's why I gravitate so strongly towards coaches in so many different elements of life, because that, that inside outside combination, there's really, it really can't be beat for 
seeing what's coming and being prepared for it. Yes, I, I agree. And, but I, I think the, the advantage of the outside coach versus the, the inside coach is a lot of companies promote coaching internally, right? And that's a great thing. And it's a, it's a fantastic tool. Um, my, my personal experience, though, is that these coaching sessions at times can turn a little bit into an assessment. Um, and, mm. and what happens is obviously during the annual talks, uh, promotions, people changes this and the other, um, you know, some of these coaching sessions can be uh, uh, held against you, so to speak, which mm -hmm. isn't a nice thing if you think about the internal coach. With the external coach, I think it's completely different. And the beauty of it too is that the external coach will be so far away from the day-to-day -day and, and, and not necessarily know the industry. But what the external coach is able to do is use proven methodologies to unlock through conversations, through challenges for the coaches, but also with homework uh, for the coachee to hopefully get better over time and train some of those behaviors required for the next promotion um, and, and to be future fit and, and basically being able to deal with whatever might be hitting the organization and, and the, the, the person itself. Yeah, I find that to be so true personally and professionally, where it's a, a, to speak personally, like you never know, you have these relationships you've had for a long time, people that know you well, that, you know, trusted confidants who have guided you in the past. But the one thing that a coach doesn't bring to the table is baggage or obligations from, again, from the past. That's and it, yes. and that, that's one of those things where it's like, sometimes you need someone who's got that level of ability to guide you that level of commitment to you that level of 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 bond that level of awareness without all the baggage that might come from you know quarterly or yearly annual annual reviews that might their their coaching might play into that because then it's then it's not just coaching it's also like internal evaluations and then it's like, yes. it gets it gets it gets mixed up there's a lot of baggage that comes along with that and there's something very very clean and powerful about having that outside coach come in and really actually coach literally guide the, the from the top to the bottom of the organization towards wherever they need to get to next i'm i can talk to you about this stuff all day i could like the the the, the kind of high concept you know precise like i, I love this stuff but I, I just looked up at the clock and realized we've already been talking for a while i haven't even asked you like about the specifics of your business like and you've already kind of touched on quite a bit of it but I like to I like to give give my guests a chance to talk about who they coach specifically if they have a particular uh, character profile that they that they have a, they coach a lot of these individuals or a lot of these organizations so who they coach um, and how how you coach them say like one to one or if you do smaller groups or even larger groups or if sometimes you know a course or a keynote might be better if you have any books that you've either written or that you tend to work off of for your framework so yeah who who do you coach and how do you coach them today okay. Um... To describe a typical profile will be really, really difficult. Um, what I can say is people tend to be senior, very senior. Mm -hmm. um, people tend to um, sit at, at junctures in their careers where either it's going to be a key personal decision to move on or stay mm -hmm more on a lateral trajectory or perhaps a big personal change by a changing company or changing a role within the company, which takes them uh, to another country and so on. I mean, myself, I've been an expat for the majority of my, my career. And I think I do understand fairly well what it takes to succeed in a completely different environment, but also to make the choice potentially to not move up and carry on for what, what you're doing. But the industries I, I work with are very diverse. I mean, it's anything from uh, logistics to finance to uh, consumer goods. Um, mm. So it's, it's really diverse. And as I said, for me, my, my whole coaching system, if you like, looks a lot deeper at people, but also culture or how team performance impacts an organization, mm. um, as well as obviously the individual and, and, and so on. Mm. So I think from a from an approach, um, what I always do is I, I like to work with teams alongside the one leader because I need these guys to help the coachee um, develop. If I have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I can challenge, I can, I can prompt, I can use techniques to have a good conversation and potentially have a bit of a mirror in front of a person, that is one, but I cannot 
assess. I cannot say how the colleagues perceive this person. This is why the stakeholder centered management, uh, stakeholder centered coaching for managers and, and, and teams um, is a method that really, really works for me and also for the coachee or the team that is being coached. Hmm. Nice. Where can, <laughs> I'm, I'm very conscious of the time that I let, I let, I let us stay too long in the high concept stuff, but I, I love that. Also, I really do, I want to do identify how, how across so many different kinds of industries, a lot of these principles are the same. Oh, it's, yeah. And it's, I think people get, again, they get stuck in their bubble and they think that their, their industry specific concerns, whether it's on the individual level or the organization level, or even like the small, medium or large size team level, they think they're very specific to their industry when largely with a little bit of translation or just a little bit of a shift in perspective, a lot of these issues, these obstacles, these hurdles, these pathways to success are common across organizations. And that's, again, another reason why I love the outside coach, the outside voice to come in and just, you know, know, but also let people know. It's like, no, this happens all over the place. I see it everywhere. Let me tell you what I've seen. And let's talk about what you've seen. And let's see how we can maybe make those make those align a little bit. I just, I, again, another another great another great reason to hire someone like you and bring someone like you in. <laughs> because here's the thing, right? Coaching, it's all about leadership, right? It's not mm -hmm. functional technical training. So tell me what leadership behaviors are different in industry A, B, or C. Um, you know, behaviors um, and, and team cultures, team performance, how it, it doesn't matter at which sports team you look at that performs really, really well. They have things they do, and because they do them, it helps their performance. And it, the same happens in a, in a company. Um, I don't think industry-specific coaches are necessary because... Um, as, as you just described now, what I'm uh, emphasizing is behaviors, human beings are all the same. It doesn't matter what industry they work in, how to develop a leader, how to change behaviors, how to amplify uh, the good ones and stop the bad ones is something that um, you can do as a coach if you have no clue about the, the industry, clearly. So if anyone, if anyone listening wanted to tap into your expertise and, or, or just find out more about you and your coaching approach and your life or whatever, how can people best find out more and then connect with you if they want to start a conversation, whether it's just personal curiosity, or if they're, you know, professionally looking for someone exactly like you to help their organization or to help them personally, where can people just learn more and find out more and connect with you? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm I'm a curious person myself. I, I love the the interactions with human beings, and you know, meeting new people is always nice. So if uh, someone's really curious, I'm 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 going to try and satisfy their curiosity a, a little bit. Um, so yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> so sorry, the question was. Oh, where where if 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 anybody wanted to do that, whether it was just a, a curious conversation with an interesting human all the way up to, I would like to talk about what you do and how I can hire you for my business or for me personally. So like if, if people just want to start any kind of conversation with you, where's the best place to do that? Right. Okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the, the best place to, to reach me would simply be to, to drop me a, an email. Um, so I don't know, Kevin, you can, you could oh. share this email, right? So yeah, I'll put, I'll put it in the show notes. And whatever question you have, whatever you're curious about, I'm going to try and and um, set up some, something. I'm, you know, I'm I'm here basically. I choose to um, work the amount of work I I I like to do, but I don't really go beyond that because I have a few passions. I started playing paddle, so now I play paddle quite intensively. I barbecue a lot, um, and well, other than that. Uh, anything, everything about me is not traditional. Um, you know, I was a professional windsurfer. I studied philosophy. I ended up being a CEO of a Fortune 500 subsidiary. So, and and I've lived in seven or eight countries. Um, yeah. So, if you want to hit me up, feel free, and uh, we'll have a nice little chat. Uh, no, no obligation whatsoever. Oh, I love it. You have such a you have such a beautifully curated life. I feel like we could have a whole separate podcast episode or two just talking about that. Maybe maybe I'll have you back on and we'll we'll just discuss life construction and how you've built the life that you're currently living because it sounds fantastic. <laughs> but we'll save that. They'll save that conversation for a different time. And in the meantime, 
Obviously, I'll put your email address in the show notes here. You're on LinkedIn. I think that's how we found each other is through mutual yes. connections here and there. So if you want to find out more, you can go there. You can just email them directly. And Michael, thank you for sharing some time with me today. This has been it's been a fascinating thank conversation. I feel like we just scratched the surface. <laughs> it was short, but it was a very pleasant uh, experience. Thank you, Kevin. You're welcome. Yeah, I try to keep it short and sweet here. Just enough to tease and to really like get into some of the nitty gritty and then just leave a lot of big questions hanging so that people take action, which to the audience out there, if you're curious at all about Michael, do yourself a favor and reach out, just email him, just check, you know, check him out on LinkedIn. You can, you can find him in all the usual spots, but do yourself a favor and at the very least learn a little bit about this fascinating individual um, and maybe what he can do for you, depending on where you're at. So thank you to the audience. Thank you to Michael. And we will get a chance to talk to you again here on Conversations with Coaches very soon.